and welcome to Beyond the Venue podcast with your host, MG, the venue specialist. I have here today with me uh, a dear friend and uh, industry colleague, Brandon Thrash, uh, who we'll be speaking with in our episode entitled Industry Shifts. Uh, The reason I brought him on today is he is a bartender, uh, an activist, and just an absolute industry staple um, here in Philadelphia. And so we'll be um, speaking with him. So first off, I'm going to tell our listeners exactly how we met. So we'll dive into where you currently are and where you are raised. Um, But you lived in San Francisco for some time after college, and you would meet friends of mine from, from Drexel who had moved out west. And apparently there are... Philly versions and San Francisco versions of a lot of overlap. And so the summer 2015, 4th of July weekend, show up at the bar to meet up with my friends and walks this guy who was a a little ripe because he had been hiking the Appalachian Trail. uh, And apparently this is San Francisco Mary Grace. And okay, who is this guy? What's happening? What's going on? Um, And we would just uh, spend the weekend getting to know one another, uh, checking out different bars and restaurants in Philadelphia, um, only for you to return to the Appalachian Trail um, to finish it up that fall. And we just had to have you in our city. And so I like to pride myself on pushing the hardest and trying to convince you to move to Philadelphia. So um, we're just going to go on record to say that MG is the reason that you moved to Philadelphia. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll back that. So um, I'll let you share that in your own words, um, both kind of where you are now and how you ended up in Philadelphia the first time around. Yeah, um, I think that's a really pretty good synopsis. I I was in the way that I met that group was, so I moved from Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I kind of grew up in the South in Alabama and Arkansas. um, And I moved to San Francisco to uh, basically be in restaurants. Um, I got a degree in organizational management and economics, basically organizational psychology. And it was either work for, if you're in Northwest Arkansas, it's either work for Walmart and Tyson or you work, or I was in restaurants and <clears throat> I didn't want to work for Walmart or Tyson. So I literally looked at a map and was like, where are cool food things going? I didn't know anything about San Francisco, really. Um, what year was this? This is 2000 and, uh, 13. Okay. Yeah, 2013. Um, and I, I just knew that I had a couple friends there and a couch I could crash on. So that's, that's how I ended up there. And I, I self admittedly was kind of a piece of shit in, in 2013. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 25 and, uh, yeah, who, who isn't at that age? Right. I tell you what. <laughs> so I, I left Fayetteville, uh, not on the best, uh, industry circumstances. Um, I had, uh, I mean, I don't know how we can, how much we can get into this, but really like, uh, I, on the I, time? I had, uh, I was in a management position and, um, uh, made some poor decisions as far as who I wanted to date and make oh, out no. <laughs> with. And, um, so like, I think pretty common in this industry, but like completely inexcusable and, and just being a piece of shit really. Um, and so I moved to San Francisco to kind of clear my plate. Um, and one of the things that I wanted when I went out there was, and this is this is carried through for my entire career. It's one of the best things that I've ever done is to center my relationships in um, non-industry friendships. So uh, certainly you you have this built-in community in the in the restaurant and bar industry that's really amazing, but we get this this like um, this feedback loop both negative and positive within our industry. Um, and to break that up, you need people outside of your own industry to tell you um, either, you know, whoa, that's to center you and be like, hey, that's kind of fucked up. Like that's not how, you know, for an adult lives or to say, hey, you're not actually like, you're not the shit, you know, I, you're amazing in your own industry in your own right. But like the world's not centered on food and beverage. Um, so that was the opportunity to do that was was with uh this organization that's like i say organization it's called dick bat and uh kevin mauer your friend organized it in philly and then moved to san francisco and they started a team 
And I literally Googled when I was Yeah, out we there. need to specify for our listeners that it was a softball team. So it's I was a softball team. It's I was originally on the, the Philadelphia team here. The team name was actually with ourselves. Uh, when we when we first started in the fall of 2009, because they wanted to say, oh, who are you guys playing today? Oh, we're playing with ourselves. <laughs> so we're constantly dealing with children here. Um, yeah. <laughs> but when Kevin moved to San Francisco, it, it, it's that's kind of when the Dick Bat empire began. It was like the Philly team was DickBat.com and then what DickBat.biz and biz and, and dot org. I, I think some of those websites actually still for the listeners, some of those are still up. Some of them are not um, still up, but um, yeah, that was that was my chance to to have. And all those guys have kids now. They all, yeah, uh, which is, I mean, that's great, you know, uh, which is re- really weird because like in San Francisco, all of them have children um, and uh, and even in Portland and then in Philly, uh, nobody has kids here really. Um, but yeah, that was, and, and, and it, that was part of that when I was on the AT, <clears throat> I got off. AT Philly, meaning the Appalachian Trail. Appalachian Trail, right. So when I was hiking that, um, I came into Philly and we had this, you know, you guys were there have thrown this 4th of July party and that's how I knew people. Um, and you guys are not, <laughs> you're not subtle about your peer pressure. Like I've never <laughs> known a group of people that just like, does it, it, there's no like healthiness about it. You're just like, this is a good thing for you because I want it. And like, like, in a really a friendship endearing kind of way, but uh, that's what it was. And that's why I ended up here is you were like, we'll get your job in the industry. Um, Neil and Vicky and Dan Mack, my, are my, my roommates now and like really good friends now were just, Hey, you can, you can stay with us until you find a place. And um, I think I was also offering up other people's homes on your behalf and, totally. and how, to, how I think, yeah. <laughs> and to our <laughs> listeners that, that don't know my background, I worked in uh, the beer industry here in Philadelphia uh, for about eight years before starting MG, the venue specialist. And so that was my connect to the bars and restaurants in the area. Um, hence my promise to Brandon that I know everyone, I can get you a job, no problem. Oh, <laughs> I have plenty of friends that own their homes and have spare bedrooms. We can get you a place to stay so you know finish up the trail take a shower and let's get you settled (laughs) I mean it worked out great so you're welcome you're welcome (laughs) Philadelphia (laughs) so where where did you end up working when you first got here yeah so um I I finished the Appalachian Trail in um 2015 um yeah 2015 and um there's this transition I I do a lot of transitioning as we'll like probably discuss but um part of this transition period for me was going home to like see my grandma and I lived with her for a couple months and when I was in San Francisco I like didn't really know a whole lot about beverage um I faked it it's like a fake it till you make it kind of thing um which I've done pretty much my whole career until I was having a discussion the other day literally till like two years ago um it was like (laughs) I just faked everything I didn't know I didn't know anything uh but I literally just read a bunch of cocktail books uh I read like 15 cocktail books and then I moved to to uh Philly and um I got a job at a uh, place called South on North Broad, which is a Bynum Brothers restaurant. I was like food running there for a little bit. Um, and then um, I applied at Veg and they offered me both a bartending position and a management position. And I wanted to actually learn beverage. Um, at the time, they didn't know that I didn't know anything about beverage, um, that I just like read books, basically. Um, and I uh, got hired there, and uh, a few months later, got hired at Townsend as well. So I worked at Veg and Townsend for years, um, a couple couple of years. We uh, we spent a lot of nights at Townsend, and I actually walked past there the other day and realized. It's been well over a year since I closed a bar down at two o'clock in the morning that I just hadn't thought about it in so long that it was, that was kind of one of those, that's a probably good thing. (laughs) (laughs) I'm almost 40 that 
it's probably on the better side that I am going to bed at a reasonable hour on the weekends and not closing down bars at 2 a.m. and having these hefty bar tabs. Do I miss your cocktails? Yes, immensely. Um, you know, a little give and take. So I, I am looking forward to being able to enjoy that experience at some point in the future. Um, so, you know, that segue, segue is right into what has this past year looked like for you? Um, you, we, we can jump back to it, but you had left for Chicago and spent a couple of years in Chicago. And then re- you only just returned to Philadelphia in early 2020. Is that correct? Yeah, I think, I think January. Yeah. The, so I left, I left Townsend, um, primarily to, to go and, and, um, tour Europe, um, for like three months, which was great. But, um, the idea was bigger in, um, that I, I had been in Philadelphia and like started to be consumed in this culture, which is really, really great. Like, like you mentioned Townsend, um, it's such a, it was such an industry heavy bar. And, um, I mean, I could have just spent years there just doing that. And uh, there's certainly value in that. And I would never say that that's not, that's not an, that's an unhealthy practice, but for me, um, and my growth experience like that, I need, um, to be challenged and changed, um, pretty often. And that was what I was becoming. It was coming to the point where I wasn't being challenged. And so came back from Europe, decided to move to Chicago. Um, I'd not been in, I'd been in the San Francisco market, but I'd never been in a major market, um, as a a beverage professional. I didn't want to take the leap to New York. Um, so Chicago, once again, I had some friends there that I I flew through. They were like, come, you know, stay on our couch transition here. And I got really lucky in Chicago. Um, and I had to let you go. I, I completely understood. You had to go sow your professional oats and, and have some new experiences. (laughs) So, you know, when you love someone, you, you set them free and, and when they come back to you. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's the like main point, right? That's how, that's how we got here. So, (laughs) um, yeah, I, I was very lucky the places I ended up in, in Chicago with bad Hunter and income tax, both like amazing programs in wine and cocktails. And I learned, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about, um, kind of where I wanted to be, um, and what more specifically what my mission and what my passions were within the industry. Um, I had a, I had a conversation with, Scott Kitzmiller, also a former Philly bartender that's now in Chicago, an amazing, amazing bartender and person in his own right. Um, And we had a discussion pretty early on that one of the important things about um, being heard in this industry is to find a niche because you, you can't, you can't talk to everyone about everything, which is a really big problem to me because I like, I have this want, this need to just not only learn everything about everything, but also to like tell everyone about everything. Um, and like, I want to share knowledge so much about, about so many things. Like there's so many cool things that exist, not only in the beverage world, but like in the world, everyone should know about these things. Um, and Scott really told me, and we had this discussion and like, he taught me about like focusing in on, on these like specific things. Like, how do you want to make change? Um, and how do you want to create change by focusing in on one or two problems? Um, so that was when I, I learned, I like really developed into this idea of, um, uh, spirits are, uh, an agricultural product. They come from the earth and that's a reflection of how we farm in America. Um, and the way that we buy spirits and the way that we approach beverage should be not only it should be a decision, a thoughtful decision with that in mind. Um, so that was this what ultimately led you to, um, uh, going out to Oregon for harvest and, and spending time, uh, uh, what was it? Ross Maloof's winery? Ross and Ross and B Maloof. Yeah. Maloof wines. So that came actually came kind of, um, in tandem with that, uh, Ross, also, maybe it's just a Philly thing to like pressure people to do good for themselves. That's like <laughs> the peer pressure, uh, everyone to do good. Um, but they invited me out slash peer pressured me out to like go and do harvest with them. And that was a really like, tr- like transcendent moment in my career, um, working with 
grapes every day and working with people that believed, truly believed that everything that went into the earth and everything that uh, went into the grapes came out. Um, I had a, a conversation out there that I'll never forget with Dan Rinke, who is um, art and science cider. Oh, was, delicious cider. Be, yeah, cider. delicious. Um, he, was, he was a winemaker and farmer for Johan Vineyards uh, for years. Um, incredibly, incredibly smart man. Um, one of the best biodynamic farmers in the country. Um, and we had a discussion about, we were like talking about his cider ferments and I was looking into this barrel and there's just like, mold and growth and like stuff oh shit all over the top of the ferment and I'm like do you ever worry about like off flavors in your cider ferments because of this mold um and he said no it's an enclosed ecosystem so whatever went into it will be what comes out um and everything will eventually just ferment out and if I believe in my in my fruit, so at the time that was apples, but he also believed this about grapes and wine. If I believe in my fruit and everything that I put into the soil then comes out of that fruit and then ferments through to the beverage, then I have nothing to worry about. And he could, he creates some of the best, uh, cleanest ciders and, and wines in the country. And there's that idea was taken to the extreme, right, for me. Um, and I started following. Um, along with all these people, these farmers, and people that had the same belief that um, everything that goes into an ecosystem then comes out. Um, and I believe that, like, that's a larger scope for me. Um, that's why I don't watch horror movies. That's why I don't, like, watch, like, or listen to, like, murder podcasts, is because if it goes into the ecosystem, it's going to come out some way. And sometimes that's anxiety. Sometimes that's um, just a, a cynicism or pessimistic look on life, but I don't, I don't want that into like that, the, any kind of ecosystem. Um, and we're getting like pretty esoteric here, but that's like, that drives my decision-making and my belief system across all things. And from an industry perspective, that was like, this is, this is it, right? Like this, everything that goes into this industry drives what comes out of it. Um, so we need to make more conscious decisions about everything we're doing. That's that means the way that we approach beverage. That means the way that we approach um, our employees and what we're putting into them. The way that we um, we source food. Like every part of this is part of a much much larger ecosystem, um, and we need to make make those decisions consciously. Well, and that's been one of the the silver linings that I've seen with the pandemic is. Um, you know, places like Primal Supply Meats who have been doing incredibly well being able to get locally sourced um, butchered meats um, as well as uh, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the 20% service charge that a couple of places are doing. Um, I think it's a great idea that, you know, being able to pay front of house and back of house um, a living wage, give them health benefits. And to our listeners that aren't very familiar with front of house versus back of house, um, front of house being, you know, hosts and hostesses, servers, um, you know, managerial staff who are literally in the front of the kitchen and then back of house being in, in the back who are, you know, your cooks, chefs, dishwashers, um, bus people. So I, I'm, I get excited when people do that. And even though I tip <laughs> delivery, we go out, like everybody, every single person that gets tipped is getting hella tipped during this pandemic because <laughs> right. people you, are literally, you get, a tip. you get a tip, you get a tip. Everybody is just putting themselves essentially in harm's way so I can have chicken wings or my hair can look amazing or you know my nails can. So it's, um, I just believe in giving more than that standard 20% because of the importance of what they're doing. Um, do you have any feelings about the 20% or does it depend on the type of establishment? Yeah, I, I think this is a, I don't know if I can speak so much to like exactly like a percentage that should be um, taking place. Cause to me, this is such a larger um, idea and, and issue with our, our industry. I mean, we're talking about um, basically this gets into what is the true cost of service and 
um, the way that I frame this is what is the true cost of food service? Cause that's what I do. Right. And like someone that's in hair and nails may frame it differently. And someone that's um, in um, like is a, a stripper or prostitution may uh, frame it differently or retail, but like we're talking about like the cost of service and like, to me, the cost of food service has, we have such a long way to go um, mm-hmm. in this issue. And like, there are people working on it in different corners. <clears throat> and the way that like, I've seen this is we have to, we have to convince people or show people um, or legislate through this issue of when we go out to eat and we see, we'll, we'll start with the cheeseburger because it's so u- ubiquitous. If you're at a, like a sit down restaurant, you see a cheeseburger in Philadelphia and it's between 12 to $15. You're like, that's a fair price for a cheeseburger. If it's $17 at like a sit down restaurant, you're like, that's a little bit expensive. But really the cost of that cheeseburger, the true food cost of that cheeseburger, I think is like double that. I think it's $25, $30. Um, and the way that you get there is, are you paying fair wages? And there's the wage equality between your front of house, the servers, and the back house, the kitchen crew. Um, n- no, the answer is just no across the board. Um, are there environmental impacts to what you're doing? So are you sourcing that cheeseburger, that burger meat from um, Primal Supply, or are you sourcing it from Cisco? If you're sourcing it from Cisco, there's environmental impacts. And somebody, as an economist, someone has to pay that environmental impact. And right now, the environment is paying that environmental impact. And like, what I would like to see is for the consumer to pay that environmental impact by sourcing better meats. Um, there's a mental health impact on the servers and, and the wait staff. Um, there's a gentrification aspect where your burger is cheaper because that that uh, restaurant is going into a cheaper neighborhood and the owner has to pay less in rent. Therefore your, uh, your burger is cheaper. And so the neighborhoods themselves are being gentrified and paying for that burger. And then the profits for the owners have gone down from an average of, um, eight to 12% in the late nineties to now being an average of 2%. Um, so even the owners are being impacted. So there's this enormous issue that we have and, Fair wages and and tipping and wage equality and the abolishment of tipping is just the beginning of this, like what I view as like a 40 year problem of getting people to understand the true cost of food service um, and fighting that fight on every aspect. And I I think that becomes really overwhelming for a lot of people, um, especially on our side of the industry. And so now I'm never going to look at a cheeseburger the same again. I I'm, I'm going to just envision you speaking to the the true cost of this good and just thinking about you with a a, a whiteboard and a marker, <laughs> just drawing all of this out so I could get a visual because I'm personally a visual learner. For sure. Um, but that's that's absolutely fascinating, and I think that all of this work and research that you've done, it's you're going back to what you said in the beginning of finding that niche of what is important to you and what you're passionate about and and running with that. Uh, do, do you have any aspirations for a political career or <laughs> um, this it's um, I mean, we obviously don't need any more white men in politics, but um, <laughs> we we do need someone with your passion and drive, you know, fighting for the industry and raising issues that are super important. Because I know that this is also just the tip of the iceberg of uh, things that you raise awareness about um, and and ask for calls to action for. Yeah, I think that um, I, Adam Grant or or maybe Brene Brown, I, I, one of those uh, organizational psychologists I like love and adore, talks a lot about this idea that. Um, <clears throat> You can go through life as like a preacher, a prosecutor, or a politician, uh, depending on how you approach problems. And like, I'm a preacher, right? Like I preach um, about the issue, but like, I'm not much of a politician. There's a politician aspect that like, you have to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, And I'm much more of a preacher because I like, I'm like, so hell bent on like, there's not a middle here, you know, like, um, I don't know what the, the, the like, I know what the end solution looks like and I know what the problem is, but there's 
there's an innovations of efficiencies here that has to happen in between. And this is like a 40 year problem, not a four year problem. And that's the, that's the overwhelming thoughts. Like we can, we can fix this, right? We can, but like my aspirations is to, is to like not be the like 10 year fixer. You know, my aspiration is to affect someone that affects someone that then changes that figures out an efficiency that, that sees this podcast or listens to this podcast and they're like, well, I can fix that inefficiency or like maybe we should as a group, as a, as a society start to think about things differently. And that's, that's my aspiration. If, if somebody wants to put me up for political office, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. I just don't think I'd be a very good one. Um, <laughs> there's, there's just a, a meet in the middle that I don't have. Uh, I'm much more of like, bring these issues to the public, bring these issues to politicians and like um, convey in a very simple manner um, using like the cheeseburger as an example, these very complex problems, these very complex like economic and socioeconomic issues. All right. Well, so if you were to run for office, what city would it be in? Because you've <laughs> You've conquered San Francisco, Philadelphia, Chicago. Um, you know, what do you have a favorite city or is that just going to get you in trouble with um, with the rest of us here? I mean, no, I think so. Since I live in Philadelphia, I'll just say Philadelphia. I, there is some politician in me, I guess, but um, no, I, I think like there's a reason that I came back to Philadelphia. Um, living in all these cities. So I, major cities that I've lived in for more than two months um, would have been, um, I guess, outside of Portland, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, when were you in Fort Lauderdale? Was that, yeah, so was that early on in my career? I was the, I was a, a front of house uh, internship for Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. Oh um, my. Okay. This is, like, this is a like new fact I'm learning right now. 22 year old Brandon, um, interned in, in like South Florida, like Fort Lauderdale, uh, the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company on A1A. Wow. Um, yeah. That was, uh, a time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, they, they make their own sauces and like the seafood's not fresh, but like, it's not terrible food and, uh, the drinks are horrible, but you know, there's, there's value in their own right. I think there's like, there's a need for cheeky, terrible tourist driven places. Um, South Florida is a place I would never go back to. I, I did not like it there. I'm not like, I like beaches and I like the ocean, but I'm not like a South Florida beach person. I'm like a rocky shores of like, New England or Portugal type person or like Oregon, the Oregon coast is so amazing. Um, I, I think like, so I'm getting off topic again, but like San Francisco, um, I mean, I was there, what shit, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and when I was there, people were saying how much it had changed 10 years before from 10 years before that. And it, it used to be this like self-made grungy, um, like pick yourself up kind of city and then the tech boom happened and like all of that got destroyed but like when I was there you could see some of that remnants and there was like amazing bartenders there that had lived through that um and that was really cool but I think like even when I was there I saw some of that falling to the wayside and it gets to a point in our industry where um you're the expense of just like the the rent just the land itself has to be like you you're paying so much in rent that conceptually it's really hard to risk anything to do something really special not saying that that there's not i mean there are some special special places and bars but the percentage of places that are like unique and defined as their own and have like a ton of heart um just becomes smaller and smaller because you have to risk so much to do something that that isn't a a formula that has been tried and true right um so um like uh like nicholas torres out in san francisco is doing true laurel and true laurel is um 
like such a special cocktail bar, but he's literally like preaching terroir driven spirits and like his cocktails are amazing, but the concept itself is so off kilter um, than like the, you go in, um, there's like uh, farm to table food and there's like these six cocktails always on the menu and there's like 20 wines by the glass and like, there's a formula that works and the reason that people follow it is because it works and San Francisco because it's gotten so expensive has destroyed a lot of that um, and it takes brave people like Nick Torres to like do something that's re- unique whereas in Philly um, especially this culture of of BYO chefs allows for you to like start your own place um, maybe sink like I know it's sound. I know it's a lot, but like sink like seventy five thousand dollars, one hundred thousand dollars into a BYO restaurant, and like if it and do something that's like a little bit more unique and a little bit more rare, um, because the formula is skewed a little bit different. Well, um, and that's that also speaks to the insanity of, of the Pennsylvania liquor laws. Um, which are a complete disaster. I I remember when we visited you in Chicago, I'm like these cocktails are so inexpensive compared to and you know working as a, a beverage manager for a little bit. I finally saw it's infuriating when we're purchasing wine at the exact same cost as a consumer would purchase it at the liquor store, and so. That's why we have such a huge BYO culture is because it's an afford a relatively affordable option to be able to open up a restaurant without a liquor license because even the license itself is crazy expensive. Yeah. So um I'm assu- is is San Francisco a little bit more in line with with Chicago with the way their liquor laws are or yeah, they're they're more in line in the way that there's access, like it's not state controlled, it's privatized. Um so they're and the advantage that so there's New York, if you take the, there's like a major five or major seven cities as far as distribution goes, but like, as far as access goes, you have San Francisco, Chicago, and New York, New York and San Francisco, they're scooping up all of these like rare, um, rare like bottles or wines or beers or whatever it is. And there's like so much demand for all this stuff. Chicago is like a little bit more spread out there's not as much of a concentration of people looking for like boutique or small production products or in-demand products. So the access in Chicago is actually like better than almost probably anywhere I've ever been. Maybe like Vegas would argue with this, but um, they get all of the new releases, all of the new launches. Um, Beam Centauri is, is headquartered there. So like basically anything that Beam Centauri does. Um, what is that? Uh, can you explain a little bit to our listeners what, what Beam Centauri is? And Beam and Centauri are, it's a, a very, very large, um, spirits company um they they own like uh i don't know like a large percentage of brands that you are very familiar with all the bean products baker bookers um centauri toki centauri um japanese whiskey i don't like they a have thousand. a massive portfolio they have a huge portfolio and um, they are headquartered in chicago Right. So, and so that's so why they're kind of like the spoiled kids that get whatever they want in Chicago because it's in their backyard. Totally. And like, that's an amazing advantage in Chicago. I just never wanted for access to anything. If there was a new product that I'd heard about in San Francisco, it was in Chicago. Um, and like, if we wanted something that wasn't, it was in New York, but we didn't get it yet. We just call our distributor and be like, Hey, we need, we need these bottles. We're going to use them. Um, and like Philadelphia doesn't get, it's the opposite, right? Like, um you have to to get a special bottle that's not already in the state you have to call the distributor and convince them that it's worth um them talking to the plcb about registering it um as a product and then getting it uh shipped in in an amount that their distributor or the producer agrees to so like um say i've been trying to like get neopold brothers into pennsylvania for years now over a couple of years now and like Leopold Brothers is this amazing distillery in Colorado, but they're not going to ship just one case of liquor um, to Philadelphia to let us try to sell that or let the distributor try to sell that. They're going to need a promise of like, or not a promise, but they're going to want to ship like half a pallet. And then the distributor has to sell that. 
So the distributor is then stuck with that inventory. Um, and trying to find homes and other people who are going to purchase this product and not just you. So it's not even just a niche the, product anymore. Without any of the help of retail space. Right? right. So imagine like having a product in a state and zero retail space. You just sell on premise. Like that's, that's fucking insane. And it limits our access and the culture, the beverage culture in PA so much. It's, it, it is, it is always a challenge here. So, all right. So you moved from Chicago back to Philly in early 2020. So here we are, it's March, 2021. We've been in this lockdown for the past year. What, you know, the, all, the face of all of these bars and restaurants has changed indefinitely. Yeah. Um, what, what what has this past year been like for you? And um, uh, you're welcome to speak on. I, I know you contracted uh, COVID at some point during all of this, and you know, luckily you came out pretty unscathed. But um, you know, what's what's kind of been? I always refer to it. It's been an absolute roller coaster for me. There's been some <laughs> highs. There's been some lows. Um, but in the event space, it has just been an infuriating process. Um, so what, what, what is kind of your year as a whole looked like this past year? And then, you know, also what, what are we looking at for the rest of 2021 for, for Brandon Thrash? Yeah. Um, so when I moved here from Chicago, it was to, it was to start a, uh, restaurant with, uh, Eddie Conrad, who used to be at, um, He's the Laurel, nicest he's person good. ever. So nice. Also, also top shelf. Like, like, I we know we went Laurel, to Laurel like, for my like, birthday oh, yeah, a couple years shelf. ago. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, <laughs> like Nick's like Nick's Nick's great and all. And Nick Nick actually commented on Bob's shirt. I forget which shirt it was. It was one of the band t-shirts that Bob wears. And we were sitting at the bar at ITV and he's like, mm, great shirt. I'm like, eh, top shelf. <laughs> but when Eddie came out and talked to our table uh on my birthday, I was just yeah. <laughs> they're they're so, so nice. He's just they're so, both nice. so lovable and so nice. I I I adore them. And like um the opportunity to start a place with um with Eddie was like too much to to pass up. So I literally like moved back here for that. Um and then COVID happened. Um and you know I so I got really unlucky. I didn't qualify for unemployment. Um I just kind of had to figure things out. I um illegally started like a, a cocktail delivery service out of my home for a little bit that led to um, a couple way too hungover weekends for, yeah, for this gal yeah, right yeah. here because they were yeah. delicious um that was really cool like getting to do what I wanted to do um with no constraints um and then um I got a, a job as a beverage director for a company for I worked for them for about eight months um and at that time, the, that time, that eight months was like, I mean, that's the most intense eight months that our industry has had in you know, maybe 80 years, right? Like 90 years since like prohibition and then like the, the repeal of prohibition. So um, navigating those waters across the board was, was intense. Like I have these very strong beliefs about what our industry should be and where it should go. And I won't, I won't sacrifice either way on those beliefs. Um, but I also understand that like, if you're everything that you have is sunk into a company, then like those beliefs start, that's the first thing that you sacrifice, right? Is, is like, it's a self-preservation thing. And I sacrifice all of these things on either side and like that just started to narrow, narrow, narrow to the point that I like couldn't support what I was doing on a daily basis. And I got really unhappy. And for me, there's nothing more important than like loving the job that you do. And so I, for that and a number of other reasons, like I left the company and, um, and then I, so I got COVID um, and that was like frustrating in its own right. Um, I, like you said, I'm very, very lucky with my COVID experience. Um, I lost taste for a little bit. I had some body aches, but I never got a fever. I never got a cough. And like, I feel really, really lucky for the way that my body responded. Um, but the frustrating thing for me from a, 
at least from a professional standpoint, was the response of the like of the health department and like they call you uh for contract tracing they call call every single person they ask a bunch of questions and i answered all these questions honestly um and like what this began to reveal without being too specific was that the health department in our city wants to help but doesn't have the means to enforce the the regulations and the policies that they've enacted, um, which is wildly frustrating, um, especially from a labor standpoint, where we as laborers, as like um, the non ownership portion of our industry, don't have any power to to like make decisions anyway. Um, there's no unionization. There's no collective action. So we have like such limited power. And then the, on top of that, the legislation and the government part is not protecting it, protecting us. Um, and that was really hard. That was like an incredibly hard thing to go through and to watch happen. Um, so that's, we, I've been part of PA food workers, um, for quite a few months now. One of the important things for us is to not center a person, um, so there's a group of us that are part of this organization. Um, we're just an advocacy group. We don't, we're not a registered group, so we can't lobby. We don't have lobbying money. We don't take or give money. Uh, we're just an advocacy group bringing up issues in our industry. Um, so that's an Instagram account, it's just PA food workers. Um, but that's been one of the discussions we've had a lot is, um, you know, what's the use of having policies if you can't enact and enforce them? Um, and and yeah, the protections for our our labors in our industry are just almost non-existent when you really get down to like what can be enforced and what the owners have a decision, like what they're allowed to do. Wow. Okay. Um <laughs> so uh what what <sighs> I know for me, like I am not taking on clients for large events in 2021. So I am continuing to stick with like smaller, more intimate events for, for 2021. Um, what, what does the rest of the year look like for you? Or are we just taking it day by day, week by week? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a day by day thing for sure. Um, I've, uh, I, I'm very lucky with my roommates, um, who like had given me a chance to like, they're taking care of me for sure in like a way that's like only only friends and and partners can um so i've like uh i've pulled back a little bit and i've done a lot of reading and a lot of self exploration um i'm trying to figure out what i want to do with my future um here in philadelphia and in like in general long term um, you're going to open up the first bubba gump um franchise yeah. here in philadelphia yeah. on yeah, the exactly. penn's landing waterfront exactly I, that's i've been scoping out spots that's the i thing. it's actually going to go on passion i'm going to take over the old towns and space i i mean we've got places <laughs> closing left and right down here so um yeah. i ugh. well um, i'm yeah. ex i am just very excited to see what's what's next for you and you know i'll always be a huge fan and follow everything that you do and drink every cocktail that you make um, the, the last question that I have for you today is, you know, I'm a venue specialist. So I want to know, is there a venue that you miss or when you think about this place, um, it just, it makes you smile. And the second that you get vaccinated, you, you would transport yourself there immediately. Like what's, what's a venue that just makes your heart sing? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do two if that's allowed. Um, um, let's do your first one and then maybe, yes, I, I, okay. you're allowed to give me two. <laughs> uh, I think what, one that doesn't exist anymore that I just like always want to talk longly about was Danny's, Danny's bar in Chicago was this, uh, this like neighborhood, um, hideout, um, that was just, it was just a bar in almost like a, a residential section of Chicago. Um, that was iconic. Um, they, had live music every single night, like DJs every single night, seven days a week. Um, 
incredibly important to like both the music culture and then also just the bar culture in in Chicago. Um, there was nothing like outlandish or crazy about the the bar program. Like they just had really they had a back bar and they had wine and beer and like the atmosphere was just next to none. Um, it was it was the perfect place to hang out. I was in this old um, this old house, this old row home. And you just, the front was like the foyer area and there were stairs to like a living room. They had like little living rooms along the side. Um, and it was like almost all candlelit, almost like pitch black dark. And you could go in and you could be like this badass like um, DJ. You could be anybody and show like, up and disco. Yeah. And you yeah. said and it's, like, you said it's, not, they, did they not survive the the pandemic? Did they close due to COVID or were they? Yeah, so they didn't, they closed because of, like, n not And having it wasn't anything. just, like, a semi-permanent close. It was, we're, we're done. Yeah, it's That done. is such a shame. I am, I am terrified of just the thought of places that aren't going to come back when this is over. Um, so what is the second venue that you love? Uh, another place with, that's a neighborhood uh, hideaway that has so much heart, which is Druid's Keep. Oh, uh, yes. I I mean, that is where we spent the first time we hung out. So yeah. we were, I have spent so many birthdays at the keep and I, I miss it so much. And especially as the weather starts to get nicer, like that yeah. backyard. It's the best. I, I, it is the best. We actually had our engagement party there. Uh, I love that place so much. It, I do too. It's another, another place that literally like there's nothing spectacular about it. It's just spectacular, and but everything life. about it is spectacular. Exactly, like as a whole, it's like the it's the best. I Druid's Keep is is the best. Um, I Brandon, you're the best. I cannot thank you enough for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, I would love for you to share with our listeners how they can follow you uh, and or connect with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Instagram is probably the best way. Uh, brand, at Brandon Lee Thrash, which is my full name. Um, and then also I encourage everyone to follow uh, at PA Food Workers. Um, that's the Instagram that we're doing information spreading and advocacy work. Um, it's centered. There's not a voice for laborers out there. Um, all of the lobbyist groups are for basically, basically centered guests and owners. This is centering on uh, hourly and labor employees, a large percentage of the um, employees in this country. Um, so at PA Food Workers, um, follow along and, um, you know, keep up with uh, with your rights and, and what's going on in the industry. And you keep up that great work. Well, listeners, thank you so much for joining us today, along with Brandon Thrash, my guest. Subscribe anywhere um, you have a favorite podcast streaming service. So next week, we're going to be featuring um, another industry friend of mine, Christine Fisher. Um, do you know Christine? Have you met her before? I don't know Christine. Oh, she's, she's wonderful. So her and I have been friends. Uh, we worked in the beer industry together. And now both of us, uh, our bodies are intolerant to be able to consume beer. So we'll be diving into <laughs> our food allergies and issues, as well as getting serious with the, the topic of mental health, um, which I feel like this is definitely a subject Brandon and I could have dove into, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's time to wrap up today's conversation. So, you know, maybe we'll have Brandon back calling in from another city down the road with a future beyond the venue podcast. Uh, thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Marcus.